Oh, kiss. I'm gonna make some kind of intro. Good afternoon and welcome to Fireside Chats. <laughs> Bella! I gotta make sure I look good. Fireside Chat about big wreck stories and stuff. <laughs> I did it again. I, I recorded like four minutes. No, 10 minutes of recording with the microphone off again. I got to test it now. I got to make sure this is working. Self-conscious about what I'm saying. And, uh, and then I get in a flow and then I realized I didn't even record it. Oh boy. All right. So maybe I can be more concise with what I'm saying now that I've done it four times. In 1992, uh, I was going to Berkeley with uh, Ian, and Brian and Dave were also there. They were from Huntington, New York. Ian was from Toronto. I was from Sherburn, Massachusetts, so I was kind of the local. Uh, I was practicing hours and hours and hours. I used to practice eight hours a day, and, and when I got to Berkeley, I couldn't practice enough. But anyway, I practiced as much as I possibly could down in the uh, the rooms down in Berkeley, and there was glass doors that were soundproof, but there was like 10 or 12 um, practice rooms down there that you could book out for hours and uh, three block, three hour block at a time or something like that. And you had to put, sign up your name on the sheet, and they'd had lockers down there for your drums, so I'd pull my drums out of the locker, set up and play out all my favorite stuff like... Manu uh, on the Sting stuff and like uh, Stuart Copeland on the early police stuff and sometimes I'd play through Rush songs that I'd learned when I was like 12 because I wanted to uh, just kind of keep my chops up I would play all, I knew how to play all the Rush songs that was my first kind of drummer that I learned how to play everything from before I got into like Led Zeppelin and playing down there and he would um, just kind of hang outside and listen and um, later on down the road he he mentioned that he used to listen to me outside um, while I was rehearsing and or, or practicing or whatever and he, he kind of made a mental note and then um, I don't remember how we started hanging around but we started hanging around a lot and he was introducing me to um, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Tragically Hip from and Bruce Coburn and some stuff from from Canada that I haven't heard of that I wasn't familiar with and and uh, he started showing me his early songs and he had a four track recorder. I quit Berkeley after a year because I had a band called The Verge and we were like we were all at Berkeley and we said well we're gonna go move to uh, an apartment and we're just gonna do it. We're just gonna we're just gonna be a band. We're gonna make it. We're gonna get a manager. We're just gonna play out. We're just gonna do it. We don't need to be at Berkeley to make to make it in the music industry. So I left with uh, Ryan and uh, Matt. Matt was from Colorado. Ryan was from Austria. And we had the band The Verge. And we re I rented recording equipment from Wurlitzer and mixed it with my stuff. And we recorded it all on that eight track half inch. And I just went through it when I was going through the old Big Rack stuff. And it's just horrible. But anyway, um, we, we had the will, or I had the will, because those guys, after six months, left me in an apartment in uh, Brighton and uh, told me I had to rent out their rooms because they were leaving and we broke our lease. I got sued. Uh, I drove down to Florida because I was like, oh, I can't believe my band that I just left Berkeley for broke up already. <laughs> It was just horrible. And that's one of the hardest things to do is to find people who will just stick together and want to do the same thing and won't quit. So I was living in Brighton and uh, I was out of Berkeley and Ian and Brian and Dave were still going to Berkeley. And then uh, we started, I started getting together with Ian over there. And, and then I moved out to Framingham and I set up a studio there. I soundproofed a room, set up all my gear and, and he started coming over. I used to pick them up at Berkeley after classes or at night or whenever they had time. and. Uh, drive my van in. I had a Ford 150 van at the time, um, like a 1984 I bought for like 500 bucks. And I used to drive it in, grab them and their guitars and bring their stuff down from their two floor walk up apartment in Boston and put it in the van and go grab some beer and then go to Framingham and play all night and record music. And then uh, in the morning, I'd drop them off at school so they could get back to um, to their classes and stuff. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we did that for a long time. We created a lot of tapes. Um, there's a lot of stuff on those tapes back that are from like 96, 97 that sound like they belong on the first album. It's just amazing. It almost sounds like you didn't didn't matter what studio we were in. You were whether we were recording at home or in a studio. It just sounded like us. Like everything sounded the same almost. Um, it was just definitely we just captured a moment in time, which I think was like with like how 
how far I'm into recording and gear and the microphones and getting the right microphones and getting the right preamps and getting a great drum sound and everything. It's just basically you're just recording a musician and a song and a moment. And those things are the most important things. It's not really the gear. It's it's more about the music and the people and the vibe and the and the songs and, and everything just came together with us back then. Um, <clears throat> I think it was great. It was a great moment in time. Everyone met together at the right time, and it's it's just amazing how how many things could have gone differently, and it couldn't have happened. Like it, it really is a lot of luck. Um, but I think eventually, if you stick to what you love, you'll eventually find a group of people that you can do stuff with, and you just gotta stick to it. We met at Berkeley in '92, and then moved. To, I moved out to Brighton with the other band. They broke up. I moved to Framingham. I was working at Pizza Hut, uh, and we played out there. We made a ton of tapes, and then um, we got a tape. Uh, Ian's dad, Scott, knew somebody in the music industry, um, which was actually a part of the management trust. Alan Gregg, he got the, the tape, too. He was managing the Tragically Hip and got it up to them. They asked for more. They asked this. this I don't remember really what happened. It's uh, all kind of a blur, but the tapes that we made in Framingham got us the management deal with the management trust through Scott, through Ian's dad. I had connections. We signed a management deal with a management trust. We moved up to Toronto, lived in a place over a deli with tons of roaches, roach traps all over my room. It was gross. Like I had a futon on the ground, and I would just put roach traps around the whole thing, just trying to keep them away from me at night. It was disgusting. They had, like, salted fish hanging from the ceiling in the deli down below. It was disgusting. Um, and we'd have to walk our gear up the to the second floor or at least uh, Brian, Dave and, and I. So I'm home from work and I know that you guys love Big Rec. People are looking for stuff about Big Rec. Like this, probably release an old song of mine that I had from like 2000 that I recorded while Big Rec was in existence. I used to come home from from touring and go into my, um, actually it was Lara's studio space and I'd set up my drums and my Tascam 8-track half inch and my mic, just record songs and just, so I had my tapes and no one listened to them so I figure I can show some of those to you now. So I gotta go up the attic and um... look for some stuff that people might want to see. Oh my god, I can't even get in here. All right, somewhere over there, some big wreck stuff. Move some stuff here. I thought you just cleaned this thing. It was so nice just like a day ago. Oh my god, there's snowmen falling everywhere. Can you help me? A um, child. <laughs> I can't get into the attic because mommy's stuff is in the way. So we have already kind of gone through the stuff that was over here, down there. So I'm going to get some fresh stuff. This was kind of this like media, like tapes and things that were going to degrade if I put them into the attic. The attic isn't insulated. Can't keep stuff that's too important in here. Okay, yeah, I'm just gonna try to remove one of these boxes. I'll make do. There's my bag, my awesome bag. Marshall, my best friend, gave me for a gift for, for my wedding 21 years ago. And it's awesome. It's that guy, Rick Steves. It's a Rick Steves Europe bag. And we were going to Europe, so it was perfect. We went to Greece for our honeymoon. So it was perfect. Oh yeah. All right. So here's a big, big box of stuff. Oh my God. Maybe I should just take a piece out or two. Kind of do one thing at a time. Oh, uh, here's, this'll keep me busy. Here's a bunch of lanyards. Grab some pictures. Let's see what we got here. What's this? Oh, Kiss. The Kiss lanyards. Edge Fest. Okay, that's enough for now. I'm not taking the whole thing out of there. Let's remove ladder before closing. Wow. Wow. Rockfest 99. So, 
we were doing a ton of festivals back then in 99. The Oaf and that song were doing really well, especially in Canada. In the States, in 97, 98, oh, there's number three again. So there is two number threes. Huh. All access pass from 97, 98 with uh, stuff on the back from the album. Edge Fest 99. Sometimes you'd get these stickers. This is a sticker attached to, probably got that. Is this from the same day? Summer Fests, June, July. I got this sticker and I stuck it on another lanyard. 